Welcome one and welcome all to Storytime with I. I am your storyteller, Isaac, and today we will be exploring the library of the Jarek Mott Monastery of Fire Emblem Three Houses, where we will get to read the history and family and lore of the Fodlan region and its neighboring countries. As we delve into this, please feel free to listen to it as background. There will be images to hopefully help you along and help to know who belongs to what family and what areas we're talking about as we go through it. And yeah, I, this is put together just to help those who would rather not go through their own time reading it and just be able to play the game and so this is to allow you to just listen to it while doing that and still get the same lore and history and background information without having to use the time and gameplay to go through it on your own. So I hope you enjoy and we'll delve into the history and lore of Fodlan now. We'll start with the History of Fodlan, Part 1. Under the tyranny of ruthless disorder, the people endured a long period of suffering. The vile nemesis, who proclaimed himself the king of liberation, delighted in war and bloodshed. Rather than rebelling against his persecution, the people of Fodlan fell to his depths in a mad scramble to attain power through murder and theft. Forty-one years before the founding of the Adrestian Empire, Saint Seros appeared in the land of Enbar, and through the many unfathomable miracles she performed, spread light across the land. In doing so, she joined the shattered hearts of the purest people of Fodlan who went on to form the Holy Church of Seros. Imperial Year One, the founding of the Adrestian Empire. In the first year of our calendar, the glorious Adrestian Empire was founded. Its name was gifted by an oracle and its future blessed by the goddess. Its capital, Anvar, was chosen to govern the southern reaches of Fodland where the divine Saint Seros also lent her power. Imperial Year 32, The War of Heroes Wilhelm Paul Hresveld, the inaugural Adrestian Emperor, raised an army in pursuit of the unification of Fodlan. With his might, he hunted and destroyed any house's territory that dared to seek more power. Imperial Year 46, the Battle of Gronder. An intense battle erupted on Gronder Field, where the houses that were allied with Nemesis and the Imperial forces of the Adrestian Empire clashed. There the Imperial forces emerged victorious. Imperial Year 91, the Battle of Teltin. The houses that were allied with Nemesis once again faced off against the Imperial forces, this time at Teltin Plains. There the evil nemesis finally fell, and the Empire secured a momentous victory through the multiple stand stabs of Seros to the net of Nemesis, as was seen this was the battle first seen in the opening cutscene of Three Houses. And as you can tell, these books and this library is all published by the uh, Church of Seros, as it is in the Garrick Mott Monastery, and they are the runners of it. So, if it seems written one way, the victor typically writes history as they want, and so this is the Church's history of and what they viewed as things. Imperial Year 98, the War of Heroes Ends. The successor of Great Emperor Wilhelm I, Lycaon I, succumbed to sudden illness. 
the empire which ruled over the majority of Fodlan, took this opportunity to put an end to the seemingly endless fighting. And that is the end of the History of Fodlan Part 1. So now we will move on to the History of Fodlan Part 2. The History of Fodlan Part 2, Imperial Year 721, the First Mott War. The Dodden army invaded from across the sea, though the Imperial forces resisted the attack and drove off the enemy. The land of Mott sustained considerable damage. Imperial Year 728, the Invasion of Brigid. The Empire invaded the Brigid Archipelago, a land occupied by allies of Dagda. As penance for their refusal to surrender, the people of Brigid were relegated to a life of imperial subjugation. Imperial Year 731, the Invasion of Dagda. With the boon of a strong foothold in Brigid, the Empire mounted a large-scale invasion of Dagda. However, the fortunes of war were not on their side, and their attack failed. Imperial Year 747, the Fardis Rebellion. Lude, a descendant of one of the houses that first quarreled with the Empire, raised an army to demand independence, pulling the land of Fardis into a fierce rebellion. This clash came to be known as the War of the Eagle and Lion. Imperial Year 751, the founding of the Holy Kingdom of Fardis. Lud and his resistance army were victorious over the imperial forces. The Holy Church of Saros mediated between the two, and Fardis secured its hard-won independence as the Holy Kingdom of Fardis. Imperial Year 801, the Leicester Rebellion. A rebellion broke out in the imperial lands of Leicester, which the imperial army was unable to suppress. The Holy Kingdom, viewing the uprising as an opportunity to increase its own political sway, occupied the Leicester region, formally declaring it as a territory of Fardis. Imperial Year 861, Fardis divided. Following the death of King Klaus I, three princes became archdukes and split the Holy Kingdom of Fardis, that they may rule over it as three separate territories. Imperial Year 881, the Crescent Moon War. The archduke ruling over the Leicester region of the kingdom succumbed to illness. The lords of the Leicester lands refused to acknowledge the next archduke in line, instead plotting to rule jointly as an alliance. Imperial Year 901, the founding of the Leicester Alliance. The Leicester Alliance was officially formed after the subjugation of hostile nobles and the removal of all opposing forces in the regions of Fardis. An influential figure from the outset, Duke Regan was inarguably the heart of the newly formed alliance. Imperial Year 961, the Elmiran Invasion. The great eastern nation of Elmira crossed through Fodlan's throat and invaded Alliance territory. The Empire dispatched troops in order to help conquer this threat, and the attackers were just barely driven off. Imperial Year 1101, the construction of Fodlan's locket. To defend against future Elmiran invasions, the Alliance, the Kingdom, and the Empire joined their efforts and resources to construct the indomitable fort known as Fodlan's Locket. And that is the history of Fodlan. Now we move into the Travels, Traveler's Journal, Issue 1. A record consisting largely of the world outside of Fodlan, the author's identity is unknown, but they have clearly experienced these places firsthand. Elmira, a great kingdom to the east of Fodlan, its territory borders that of the Leicester Alliance, 
with the precipitous mountain range known as Fodlands Throat acting as the dividing line. Its people maintain a strong legacy of horsemanship and relish in the thrill of battle. This vast kingdom is rich in fertile prairies, deserts, and mountain ranges. Albinia, a continent to the northwest of Fodlan. Its frigid climate is home to numerous rare and valuable species of flora and fauna. However, the human population there is extremely small due to the intense cold and the frozen earth, which is unsuitable for growing grains or other food crops. Morphis. Morphis is the name of a metropolis of Majid to the southeast of Fodlan, as well as the boundless desert that surrounds it. In the distant past, it was called the City of Illusion. Thanks to an intricate web of trading routes, rumors of its profound and mysterious magic continue to spread. Dagda, a continent to the southwest of Fodlan. Due to its extreme distance from Fodlan, rumors of this relatively unknown world abound. Some claim it's a tropical rainforest, while others insist it's merely a giant frozen plateau. In truth, this vast continent stretches far into the north and south, and supports a wide variety of terrain and climates. Traveler's Journal Issue 2, once again just consisting of places they've been to. Brigid, an archipelago nested between Fodlan and Dagda. It is a land of plenty that is often heralded as the perfect union of the gentle sea and nature's bounty. Both Fodlan and Dagda have long vied to claim this territory as their own. Sren. Sren was once the name of an enormous peninsula in the north of Fodlan. Today, only the northern half has kept the monitor, while the southern half now falls under the dominion of the Holy Kingdom of Fargus. Several warlike clans call this great wasteland their home. Certain areas of this region are comprised of rocky desert. Duster a peninsula to the north of Fodlan and the west of Sren. The people who once inhabited this area were decimated, and it now falls under the dominion of the Holy Kingdom of Fargus. The land boasts nothing noteworthy to make it a desirable travel destination, but rumors of valuable minerals waiting to be unearthed abound. Adma Mountains, an enormous mountain range somewhat south of central Fodlan. To the west it forms the border between the empire and the kingdom, surrounding Garrett Mott and cutting across empire territory. It is home to many animals and plants that cannot be found elsewhere, as well as a plethora of valuable mineral deposits. So now we'll keep moving along here, and we'll move on to the Book of Seros, Part 1, The Revelation. The goddess is all things. She is heaven above and the land below. She is eternity incarnate. She is the present, the past, and the future. Her eyes see all. Her ears hear all, her hands receive all. She who was graced with the holy word of the divine goddess, who bore witness to her magnificence, is the one called Seros. She is the messenger of the heavens, the bridge between the lands above and below, and her blessing shall bring tidings of peace to all. With the goddess's omnipotence and wisdom to guide her, Seros ensures that her will be done. As the goddess's sword, Seros wards away evil. As the goddess's child, Seros mates emperors of mortals. As the goddess's wings, 
Saros elevates her people. As the goddess's voice, Saros spreads the love, word of love. That sublime sword is entrusted to you. Those emperors are crowned before you. Those wings clear your path. That voice whisper words of trust. May the blessings of the goddess follow you always. The Book of Seros, Part 2, The Creation. In the beginning, amid the great cloudless ocean, Fodlin came to be. At the end of a long journey, the goddess glimpsed that land, and there alighted upon the sacred ground. She breathed life into the world and created all, the, all of the creatures upon it. By the goddess's hand, plants took root, birds took to the sky, and animals roamed the land. Last of all, she created humanity. When the humans wished for power, she granted it. She gifted them the blessings of the heavens and of the earth. By way of the magical arts, humanity attained great power, yet unaware that great power portends great evil. By the grace of the goddess's divine protection, humanity thrived. Through her blessings they grew prosperous, and their numbers rose. Before long they became the most powerful creatures in all of Fodlan. All was well until darkness descended from the north, a darkness that devoured the earth, desecrated the heavens and threw the world and its inhabitants into a state of chaos. To face this evil force, the goddess created a new well of power. She gifted certain chosen individuals with sacred blood, allowing them to wield mystical weapons that they may prevail against the darkness. These souls, buoyed by their divine gifts, conquered the evil ones and drove them back to the north. They came to be known as heroes. The heroes experienced unnaturally long lives, persisting for hundreds of years. Even after they breathed their last, the power coursing through their blood remained, leaving an indelible mark upon the, this world. This power passed through bloodlines, came to be known as the Trests. The mystical weapons they once wielded are now called Heroes Relics, and so the legend of a new age was born. The descendants of the heroes sought their ancestors' power, and thusly their blood. In time they amassed crests, relics, land, and wealth, using all to set the land aflame with war. The goddess's power, intended to stem the flow of evil, became a tool of destruction, all because of the greed of humanity. The goddess grieved, and heartbroken, hid herself in the heavens from whence she came. That's so. I don't know what he's looking for. I hear you are right. The library contains... What the... It seems like something's missing to him. The Book of Seros Part 5 The Five Eternal Commandments Dare not doubt or deny the power or existence of the goddess. Dare not speak the goddess's name in vain. Dare not disrespect your father, mother, or any who serve the goddess. Dare not abuse the power gifted to you by the goddess. Dare not kill, harm, lie, or steal unless such acts are committed by the will of the goddess. The goddess cares for and protects all that is beautiful in this world. The goddess will never deny the splendors of love, affection, joy, peace, faith, kindness, temperance, modesty, or patience. Follow her example, and in doing so, abide her laws. And now we're going to be moving into the um, Register of the Houses. 
So all the houses are identified by name and stuff. So first is the register of empire nobles, part one. So a register of prominent noble houses of the Adrestian Empire. This document is expressly for official use by the Church of Saros. Sus students are forbidden to remove or peruse this documentation. 1179 edition. Horse Hresveld. So this is Edelgard's house. The most distinguished noble house of the empire. Tracing its roots all the way back to great emperor Wilhelm. It has been the governing house of the empire for 1100 years. In addition to the first emperor, its lineage is also traced back to St. Seros herself, which is why generations of emperors are believed to bear the crest of Seros. House Fresveld resides in Enbar, the imperial capital, claiming all of the surrounding territory as its domain. It boasted supreme author authority both within the empire and without until the insurrection of the Seven in 1171, in which much of its power was stripped away by the nobility. In recent years, a series of misfortunes has plied this storied house, and some believe dark clouds hover over the future of the Hresveld reign. House Ayer. This is Ferdinand's house. A house of dukes possessing great power within the empire, second only to House Hresveld. The land head of the house came to occupy the post of prime minister, rendering the tide a hereditary one thereafter. House Ayer led the insurrection of the seven, and in many ways holds the true power governing the empire. House Vestra. This is Hubert's house. A house of marquis without a domain existing in the shadow of House Hresveld. In addition to managing the darker tasks of the empire, it is responsible for the emperor's periphery affairs, including coordinating things such as ceremonies and rituals, imperial consorts, and the Imperial Guard. House Vestra was allied with House Aeir in the insurrection. House Havering. This is Linhart's house. A house of counts that the inherit that has inherited rule over the Empire's domestic affairs, particularly those relating to administration, finance, and the judiciary. It frequently clashes with the Minister of Military Affairs over these matters. Much of its territory lies in the Otma Mountains, and as such it enjoys the fruits of a lucrative mining industry. House Berdlias. This is Casper's house. A house of counts that is inherited rule over the Empire's Ministry of Military Affairs. It commands all of the armies that do not directly belong to the Emperor. During times of war, the head of the house becomes the Imperial Army's Commander-in-Chief. Their territory encompasses most of the Empire's main breadbasket, Grander Field. House Varley. This is Bernadetta's house. A house of counts that has inherited rule over the Empire's Ministry of Ber Religion, whose main responsibility is to make is to maintain amiable relations with the Church of Saros. However, due to the estrangement of the Church from the Empire in recent years, it is now more involved with the judiciary, causing political strife within the Ministry of the Interior. So now we have the Register of Empire Nobles Part 2. So once again, the Adrestian Empire, 
House Dreth, a house of dudes that has inherited rule over the Empire's Ministry of the Exterior, Diplomacy, Foreign Relations, and Relations between various provinces and the capital fall under its purview. It worked hard to secure the ceasefires that ended both the Bridget and Dodda campaigns. Though complicit in the insurrection, it remains distant from associated houses. House Arundel, Formerly a minor noble house of the Empire, as head of the house when Volthard's younger sister became betrothed to Emperor Ionius IX, Volthard was granted the title of Lord Arundel. Having worked closely with House Ayer, House Arundel is seen as one of the chief instigators of the insurrection of the Seven. House Hrim, a house of imperial viscounts resisting Emperor Ionius the Ninth's policy of power centralization. It set out to join the alliance and secure independence from the empire, but was unable to overcome the imperial army's intervention. In the aftermath, the house's main genetic line was wiped out. Its current head of house is an adoptee. House Nouvelle, a house of imperial viscounts with territory on the western coast of the empire, centered around its namesake, harbor city of Nouvelle, the house flourished thanks to commerce with Dagda. Albania, Brigid, and other territories. Even still, it fell to ruin in 1175 after permitting the combined invading forces of the Dagda and Brigid armies to make landfall. House Ox, a house of imperial barons. Its territory occupies the northern hall of the western peninsula known as Fodland's Fangs. The head of the house was lost to the Dagda and Brigid War. House Bartels, a house of imperial barons. Highly ambitious, it sought out and acquired several trusts for its bloodline. In 1176, many members, including the head of the house, died under unexplained circumstances. The deed was attributed to the heir Emil, as his whereabouts are unknown. Leadership of the house fell to a distant relative. So now we, we move on to the Register of Alliance Nobles. So this would relate to the Leicester Alliance. A register of prominent noble houses of the Leicester Alliance. This document is expressly for official use by the Church of Cerro. Students are forbidden to remove or peruse this documentation. Once again, 1179 edition. House Regan. So this is Claude von Regan's house. The leading house of the Leicester Alliance and descendants of one of the ten elites. In the Crescent Moon War of 881, they spearheaded the move toward independence from the kingdom, as well as the establishment of a republic by its former vassals. They have held the esteemed responsibility of leading the Alliance Roundtable ever since. The position of this house of dudes relies on the noble rank bestowed upon it by the kingdom. Well before the Alliance's founding, the current Duke Regent's heir Godfrey died in an accident while on duty. While he did leave behind a surviving daughter, she is presently unaccounted for. House Gonroll. This is Helda's house. Descendants of one of the ten elites, is a, it is a military house that is chiefly tasked with military strikes and defense against the Almeran army, mostly due to its territory's position in the east. Lord Host, the next head of the house, is widely renowned as the Alliance's bravest general. House Ordelia. This is Lysithia's house, a house of counts with land in the east of the Leicester territory. In 1167, it was involved in House Krim's Rebellion, 
and the empire retaliated by repeatedly meddling in the house's internal affairs, leading to a sharp decline in, a, in its noble standing. House Gloucester, this is Lorenz. Descendants of one of the ten elites, this house of counts hails from southern Leicester territory. The current head of house is ambitious, it sells at public relations, and has an influential voice among the five noble families with voting rights at the Leicester Alliance Roundtable, second only to House Regan. House Edmund, so this is Marianne's house. A house of Margraves with land in the north of the Leicester territory. Its beneficial trade policies, emphasizing fair use of its personal harbors, have awarded the house a great deal of clout, to such a degree that it was eventually accepted into the ranks of the five great lords of the alliance. Their current head of house is a renowned orator. House Daphnel Descendants of one of the ten elites and formerly among the five great lords of the alliance, it lost much power due to internal discord. For the last several Several generations, no head of House Daphnel has borne a crest. In spite of this, it still maintains its status as a noble family. And our final book, The Register of Kingdom Nobles. So this is the Fargus Kingdom or the Blue Lions, a register of prominent noble houses of the Holy Kingdom of Fargus. This document is expressly for official use by the Church of Seros. Students are forbidden to remove or peruse this documentation, 1179 edition. House Bladed, so Dimitri, Dimitri. This house claims Bladed of the Ten Elites as its ancestor. It has ruled the kingdom for over 400 years. Ever since Luke, the King of Lions, claimed victory in the War of the Eagle and Lion in 751. This secured the kingdom's independence from the Adrestian Empire, after which Luke was crowned as its inaugural king by the Church of Seros. House Bladed resides in Fer Feridiad, the kingdom capital, claiming all of the surrounding territory as its domain and many of the fiefdoms in the north of Fodland as its vassals. With the passing of King Lambert in 1176, his older brother, Grand Duke Rufus of Itha, assumed the burden of ruling the kingdom in the young crown prince's stead. Even still, Strife and disorder continue to plague the land. House Fraudarius, this is Felix. This house of dudes claims Fraudarius of the ten elites as its ancestor. It is one of the most ancient houses on record, even amongst kingdom nobility. It is said that Kifon, the sworn friend of Lude, the King of Lions was also related to the hero Fraudarius. House Gautier, this is Sylvain. This house of Margraves claims Gautier of the Ten Elites as its ancestor. Its territory lies in the northernmost reaches of the kingdom. As such, it has safeguarded kingdom territory against incursions by the people of the Sren region for over 200 years. House Charon. This house of counts claims Charon of the ten elites as its ancestor. Tasked with negotiating between the resistance armies and the Church of Seros during the War of the Eagle and Lion, the head of house Charon continues the tradition of a ceremonial competition within the kingdom. House Galatea. This is angry. When House Daphnel, once a cornerstone of the Leicester Alliance, was divided in two over an inheritance feud, half of them defected to Fargus and established House Galatea, which was granted the noble title of Count. 
Much of its territory consists of a frigid wasteland where severe famine occurred in the early 1170s. House Row, a noble house that once held territory in the Northern Empire. When the fortress city of Arianhard was constructed within its domain, it revolted against the empire and pledged the entirety of its territory, including Arianhard, to the Holy Kingdom of Fargus. For this contribution, it was awarded the noble title, title of Count. House Clyman. Thus, this house originally held no more than a lordship over a single castle in the west of the kingdom, but it was awarded the noble title of Viscount for its great success in the subjugation of the Duster region in 1176. Afterwards, it was granted the Duster region as its feudal estate. And the, that is all the books of the library, currently at least. I am hoping there will be more and lot and more history and lore to unfold, especially since it seems but three and four of the but of Seros are missing. Um, it'd be interesting to see what's in them and why it was taken out or missing for a period. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this story time with I, and if you have any theories or any ideas on things you'd like to see done on this channel, please feel free to let me know in the comments, and I will try my best to um, get those videos together as best I can. This is the first video I've made, and so hopefully it goes alright, and hopefully all the pictures showed up well, and the audio and visuals have worked well for you, um, and I hope this has just brought a greater understanding and a greater interest in the continent of Fodlan and in the lore of Fire Emblem Three Houses that's brought even more passion towards this game as we all delve into it and get to know what it's about. I hope you have fun playing your games and that you've enjoyed this story time. We'll see you next time. Thanks for stopping by. Bye. Hey everybody, Interval with Eidador here, and I have a additional copy of Fire Emblem Three Houses, woot woot, so I'm going to do a giveaway with it. Um, this is my first video, and so... If you like, subscribe, and comment on who your favorite character is in Fire Emblem Three Houses. Um, and then I'll choose someone from the comments and they'll win a copy of Fire Emblem Three Houses. And we'll get in contact together, I'll figure all that out, and make sure to get you your copy. I have, I ordered both the Seasons of Warfare edition and a copy from GameStop to get the pin, so that's why I have the additional copy that I'm wanting to do the giveaway with now. So yeah, if you're wanting a copy of Fire Emblem Three Houses, be sure to like, subscribe, turn on that notification bell, and then comment. And if you want to not like the channel after that, that's cool. But I hope you enjoyed this interval with I, and we'll see you next time. Have a great day.